If you're not familiar with the FMA, it is an educational institution uh, intended to further the interests of fabricators and manufacturers in North America. Um, today we're to celebrate Manufacturing Day with a panel presentation on how manufacturing drives the economy. Uh, we are celebrating this week on October 7th, the fifth annual Manufacturing Day, which consists of open house events conducted all across the United States uh, to encourage young people to explore opportunities in uh, careers in manufacturing. The first Manufacturing Day had 240 events and this year we are homing in on 3,000. Uh, that is on October 7th. We have four panelists uh, with quite a bit of experience in public policy and leading uh, large and small organizations. Our first is Stephen Gold, who has three decades of executive management, law, public policy, and communications experience <coughs> serving and representing U.S. manufacturers in their efforts to become more competitive. He currently serves as president and CEO of the Manufacturers Alliance for Productivity and Innovation. He uh, has served as senior vice president of operations for the National Electrical Manufacturers Association, vice president of the National Association of Manufacturers, and uh, this is all fortified with degrees in history and law. Uh, our second panelist is Scott Mayer, chairman and CEO of QPS Employment Group. Uh, this is a privately owned company that Scott founded in 1985. He opened a single office with two employees and now has nearly 50 locations and 300 employees. He has decades of experience as a small business owner that serves small, medium, and large businesses and has a thorough understanding of the challenges of recruiting and staffing and has first-hand knowledge of the importance of manufacturing and training necessary to prepare the workforce for tomorrow. Uh, third panelist is Ken Wojtek, who has degrees in economics and public policy, uh, served as an economist for the Michigan Department of Commerce, uh, was the chief economist for the National Alliance for Business, and has held positions at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, including chief economist and uh, chief of manufacturing policy and research group. Last is Chris Keel, who holds a PhD and master's degrees um, in political economics, Asian studies, and Soviet East European studies. He serves as chief economist for the National Association of Credit Management. He's an economic, analyst, economic analyst for the Missouri Society of CPAs, economic analyst for FMA, and he's a managing partner of a business he founded, Armada Corporate Intelligence. So my goal here I think as, as to kick off this program is simply it's, it's, it's to demonstrate that not only are the reports of manufacturing's de demise greatly exaggerated, but the sector actually remains more important in today's 21st century economy than official statistics suggest. Now there are those who say that, you know, we're trending toward a pure service economy. A lot of well-known economists have said that over the last 15, 20 years, but they miss an obvious but rarely acknowledged fact. And that is manufacturing goods are ubiquitous in every facet of our lives. Why do official statistics, and when I talk about official statistics, and I'm talking about the federal government statistics, why do they undercount manufacturing's contribution? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you three things that we discovered about, uh, in, about official statistics. And it's not the government's not trying to undermine manufacturing. There's a reason why they did this, but it does in fact lead to an undercounting of manufacturing um, uh, data statistics. So the first one is the government categorizes manufacturing activity under three North American industry classification system NAICS codes, 31, 32, and 33. But only the economic activities that are uh, completed or done at the plant level, the establishment level, are included. That means all manufacturing related work that's not performed at the plant site. Now think of R&D, engineering, corporate management, logistics, operations, marketing. They're not counted within manufacturing's NAICS codes. Next, government only measures the value of manufacturing's upstream supply chain, which assumes that manufacturing's value chain actually stops at the factory loading dock. The problem with that is that there are um, thousands and thousands of establishments in this country, tens of thousands, that, are, that have been created on the downstream sales side that are only in business because we make products in this country. 
When calculating the official size of manufacturing, official statistics only include the value of goods sold to final demand. Now, for the economists on the panel in the room, it's, co it's fairly complex, but the fact is that the final demand means you're selling to an end user. You're selling to households, you're selling to government, you're selling to businesses, you're selling for export. Um, the goods that are made as intermediate input for non-manufacturing um, supply chains, for instance, gypsum, that's sold to the construction sector's supply chain, that is not included in the manufacturing. That's included in construction's um, economic activity. So we, of course, included the value of that in the manufacturing footprint as well. So such a narrow definition, official definition of manufacturing, does help explain why manufacturing's footprint is understated, and it explains why we decided at MAPI and in Forum to go ahead and undertake this study. In terms of jobs, uh, upstream supply chain adds 15.4 million jobs, downstream sales chain adds 23.5 million jobs, and manufacturing that's sold in non-manufacturing sector uh, 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 supply chain uh, streams, 3.2 million jobs, a total of 42 million jobs, more than 42 million jobs. So when you take a broader look that we have, and I think a more accurate look, a more accurate accounting of the manufacturing footprint, while the official statistics suggest that manufacturing is 11 percent of GDP and 9 percent of employment, in fact, our estimates come down to, uh, boil uh, down to 33 percent. Manufacturing represents 33 percent of the GDP and about 33 percent of total employment. The final thing I, I, I want to mention is that we, in conjunction with Inforum, we also developed a new manufacturing multiplier. Now, a multiplier uh, is simply a, a, a calculation that shows the impact that a business or that a, an industry or sector has on the rest of the economy. And, the, and, and what we did was we took the current one that the government uses. We eliminated a lot of the double counting. Uh, we provided more comprehensive treatment to the multiplier. And what we found is that for every dollar of manufacturing value add in this country, another $3.60 of economic activity is generated throughout the rest of the economy. The official statistics right now is about $1.40, but our expanded view, uh, view of, uh, of manufacturing shows that it's actually $3.60 of additional economic activity uh, created. And then if you express the multiplier in terms of jobs, for every manufacturing job created, full-time manufacturing job created, it requires 3.4 other jobs in other sectors to create it to support the manufacturing sector. Our central finding is that the, cons the conventional measurement that the federal government uses, uh, that national t statistics use to, to show the percentage of manufacturing share of G GDP is greatly, grossly understated, and the manufacturing footprint's actually about a third of the economy, not simply 11 percent or about a tenth of the economy. And I think this, we all think uh, in MAPI and at Inforum that this assessment provides a much better assessment of the size of manufacturing's value chain, and it also improves the understanding, I think, that our society and hopefully policymakers would have uh, in, in terms of the reach and the importance of the manufacturing sector in our economy. In full disclosure, I'm from Wisconsin. We actually have Manufacturers Month, so it's a little bit of a different thing, but we also have the Packers up there. I got people here that fight with the Packers thing. That's why I need to do that and throw that in. Let's make this a little interactive. Who out there in the audience is having trouble finding people for your jobs? Okay, there's some hands going up. I think if we're honest, everybody's struggling. There's a huge skills gap, and it's really a people Thing. You know, we're out of people. And where does it come from? It started probably 20 or 30 years ago where somebody got a harebrained idea. Everybody in high school has got to be trained and geared to go to college, get that sexy four year degree. They took away all the shop classes, woods, metals, welding, all that kind of stuff, and replaced it with junk for the kids that are being pitched to go to college. And it's great. Half the people should go to college and go to Madison and Illinois and get that four-year degree. But the other half of the people, me, you didn't talk about, you talked about all these degrees. Uh, it didn't happen. It wasn't for me. It wasn't right. And that's okay. I'm not a complete failure, not <coughs> as sharp as these guys, but nonetheless. So half of us should go into vocation, apprenticeship, go to work. Man, why go get a four-year degree 
and then go to work at Starbucks or come to our local factory and be a packager. It's insane. I come from Wisconsin. I'm on the board of Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce, and our chairman says factories, and this is his little line, they're not dark, dirty, and dangerous anymore. They're great jobs. But again, when the schools are pushing them in this direction, they're not seeing this great opportunity, and it's changing, and it's gonna take years of cultural changes to steer people, getting thousands of kids from high school to go and experience manufacturing. That's what it's gonna take, but this is a mountain that we gotta move because we took so many years of steering them in the wrong direction to now steer that segment back. But we're pointing people in the right direction. The other thing I need to implore you to do is go on is the day where you can say, I need a MIG welder with 10 years experience doing this and sheet metal and that. Uh, those days are kind of gone. We won't even take a welder opening unless you're open to taking a good candidate that's willing to show up every day, work hard, have a good attitude, and you train and develop. We're, it's a kind of a renaissance in the manufacturing world. We gotta go back to the days of hiring for talent and then training for the specific skill because if they're not out there, you gotta create them and make them. <laughs> we provide you with the good people, you take them and develop them, and that can hopefully help because as you heard, uh, there's a lot of jobs out there that are supported by this and a lot more coming and we can continue to grow our economy but we need to work with people and uh, develop the next set of skills, the next generation because us baby boomers are getting old and we need that next pipeline. So hopefully that gives you a little taste of my world and uh, we'll move on from there. I'm Ken Wojtek. I'm the uh, chief economist for the Hollings Manufacturing Extension Partnership. And one of the things that we just want to talk about very briefly is the MEP program works predominantly with small and mid-sized manufacturers. So that's kind of my orientation coming into this. It's not necessarily looking at the OEMs and the large firms, but really diving down, which really is, is sort of the heart and soul of manufacturing, which is the small and mid-sized manufacturers. And I think it's important to keep in mind that roughly 60% of a manufacturer's cost is in their supply chain. Manufacturing is changing. It's getting smaller, but small manufacturers have to get smarter. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. They need to think about you know, doing things differently. Uh, the productivity gap between large manufacturing establishments and small manufacturing, es manufacturing establishments is increased significantly over time. Uh, and I think that's important to kind of keep in mind. And the reason I, I continue to focus on this notion about productivity is remember, productivity is what determines wages and your standard of living. And the key, and I think the most important thing to keep in mind is, you know, employee recruitment has nearly doubled in terms of a challenge for small and mid-sized manufacturers. Product development has increased a little bit, as well as technology. Uh, and I just want to kind of emphasize that. You know, so these, many of these trends have stayed consistent over time, but we have seen some, some changes. Uh, and you know, lots of folks talk about the skill shortage. They talk about all sorts of things. And here's a measure uh, which looks at the ratio of the number of hires to job openings. And the, you know, the point isn't so much to look at the actual ratio, but to look at the trend. So what that suggests is lots of companies are putting out advertisements, uh, looking for people, uh, but they're not hiring them at quite the same rate. Now, has anyone ever heard the uh, use of the term purple squirrels? Uh, Peter Capelli, who's a professor at Wharton University, coined that term a couple of years ago to highlight the fact that many companies are looking for a purple squirrel. Now, the last time I was hunting in the woods, I didn't find too many purple squirrels. Because what they're looking for is this unique person. And he uses an example of someone who was supposed to be working um, in a snowball stand. And the advertisement actually said, have a four-year degree uh, and have five years of experience to work in my snowball stand. Uh, so that you know, just sort of highlights the fact that on some level, employers, while they're kind of putting their foot out there, are also looking for very, very unique sets of skills, very unique um, you know, requirements. 
the face of manufacturing employees is changing. A lot of jobs in manufacturing are no longer on the production floor. Uh, I know it's hard to believe for folks, but I used to work in a steel mill when I was a young man. Uh, and one of the things that struck me in the 1970s was when I worked in those mills, there were thousands of people out there. Uh, about 15 years ago, when I was working downtown in D.C., we took a bunch of young students or interns that were working for us on a trip to Sparrows uh, Point, the big Bethlehem Steel uh, facility that used to operate in Baltimore. And I remember walking down one of the lines, and I was struck. It was like there was no one around. It was like, where is everybody? When I was a kid, when I was 18 years old in college, there were thousands of people swarming around. It looked like ants. And then you happened to look up in the uh, upper right-hand corner, and everybody was sitting in a pulpit, uh, looking at their computers. That's how everything has changed. In addition, and I think this is an important thing, uh, the workforce is getting older. Uh, and I think there's an opportunity. I mean, you know, when Scott talked about the issue about immigration and those kinds of things, which I think is important to consider, it's also important to consider how can we lengthen the opportunity for people to work for a longer period of time. And some of that includes things like technology. So while oftentimes we talk about technology is destroying jobs, it actually may be a benefit for older workers to be able to, to use that. Um, and here's the final thing. Um, so you're a small manufacturer, and you're sitting there going, you know, geez, the global economy stinks, uh, oil prices have tanked, you know, everything's sort of bad. And I, I really kind of, you know, what I, what I found in our research is the fact that, you know, there's really three key ingredients for a small firm to kind of think about. The first is uh, what I call talent. Uh, so it's important to focus on sort of the human capital aspect. Uh, it's also important to focus on technology. Uh, so thinking about technology, how can they I use that, deploy that. But I also think it's equally important for companies to think about what I call techniques. Uh, and that includes things like strategy, operational excellence, and those kinds of things. I think it's also important to look at those as complements and not necessarily substitutes. Uh, that if you change technology, it changes the requirement for talent, for skills. Uh, if you change some techniques, it changes other things. So I think it's important to kind of, you know, con continually sort of think about that uh, as you're going forward. And with that, I'm done. I'm kind of going to be winding up with some comments that kind of weave in amongst the ones we've already heard because a lot of it is kind of reiterating the problems. I mean, you look at the sort of research that Steve's group is doing, that's one of the great challenges in economics is that we're never quite sure that we're measuring things the way we should. We have seen a lot of change in terms of technology. And one of the leading critics for the way that we measure productivity from a technological perspective is the economist for Google, um, Hal Varian, has been harping on this for years, basically saying, look, we're measuring productivity in kind of a pre-technology way. He doesn't necessarily, and few do, know what we replace that system with, but we know that we're doing more with less, we're more efficient, one of the most crushed occupations in the world over the last several years has been administrative assistance. Who needs an admin when you have a phone and a computer? All the things they did 20 years ago. One of the things that we talk a lot about in manufacturing is the global impact and it's generally seen as a negative. We're looking at competition from the rest of the world, from China, from Asia, and we sort of forget that they're sort of in that same structure as we are. We still participate heavily in global business, but we do it in, in this intricate way. I mean, every company you know is heavily involved in every economic region in the world, and there's parts going in and out of that process daily, and we don't live in a discrete sort of economy. The idea of a nation state was sort of abandoned by the business world 20 years ago. 
and people do business across borders. They do it effortlessly. You talk to people about the automotive sector and you know the importance in the U.S. economy, and it always surprises people to learn that the most American car they can own is a Toyota Camry from Ohio. <laughs> the least American car you can own is a Ford. We are in a kind of a transition phase when it comes to manufacturing. We have companies that are still fundamentally old school, that are sort of participating in the world as it was. We also have companies that have welcomed and embraced a new world, and it is a more intricate one. It is robotic and it is technological, but it's also very different from a management perspective. Uh, back in the day, back when we were young, at least I was young, we all had shop. We all had these classes. We had instructors, the thinkers like this. And, you know, you didn't need anything more than a couple of drill presses and a lathe. I mean, now you can't do an industrial arts program without sophisticated equipment and computers, and the schools can't afford it. They can't afford band instruments. They can barely afford an industrial arts program. So it gets abandoned, and it ends up pushing a lot of people into sectors they don't know a whole lot about. When I used to teach, I figured out that there were different ways that people learn. People learn through listening, they learn through reading. There is a quarter of the population that is a kinetic learner. They learn with their hands. And if you put a kinetic learner in a circumstance like this, it's like Charlie Brown's parents. Within about five minutes, all they're hearing is wah, 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 wah. <laughs> You can tell if you're a kinetic learner because you have already doodled everybody in this room. You know, you're, you're just like, I can't stand it. Will they please shut up? Four of them, my God. You know, so um, <laughs> these people are going insane. But we don't do a good job of identifying the kinetic learner. We're not doing a good job of identifying how manufacturing impacts the economy. I mean, it's... When we compare the way that we measure the contribution of manufacturing to other parts of the world, we're woefully inadequate. As mentioned in the introduction, I'm the economist for the National Association for Credit Management. Credit managers are fascinating people. No one will ever meet one. Um, they are buried in the bowels of every business. They're the ones who are deciding who does and who does not get credit to buy a machine, buy inventory. We learned a number of years ago that if you surveyed what credit managers were doing, you begin to get sort of a, an advanced look at where the economy is going because they, because of the nature of their profession, think in the future. Favorable from the credit manager's perspective are sales, applications for credit, dollar collections, and the amount of credit extended. All four of those things were fading until last month, and they all hit numbers we have not seen in over two years. What we're beginning to get sort of anecdotally, and we'll see if this plays out in the next couple of months, companies, and many of you have been experiencing this, companies have been delaying their purchases. They want that machine. They know they're going to get that machine. They don't want it now. They're not sure what's going on now. They're worried about Brexit. They're worried about the election. They're worried about something. And so they're sort of telling the machine tool makers, I want to be in line, I want that thing, I just don't want it now. I want to see what happens, I want to see if there's going to be an improvement. There is a sense that a lot of the manufacturing sector has been kind of on hold. They have been waiting to see kind of what happens with key sectors. They got very excited about the oil and gas world and then that kind of fell out from underneath them. They got very excited about the automotive sector, that has started to slow a bit. So they're kind of waiting to see what's the next big thing. You know, what's the next thing that's going to be driving their business? And that's likely to be more global business. So you start to go places like Botswana, or, and that's just one example of a place most people have never heard of, but Botswana is agricultural and it's cattle country. And what they have done for years is raise cattle and then sell <laughs> it to somebody else. Now they're doing their own processing. And all of a sudden, they're in the value-added business. All of a sudden, they're making a lot of money. And these are connections that we've developed with these countries over the years. We talk about the importance of immigration. We also have to talk about the importance of keeping those connections open. And I'll leave you with this one stupid example. 
As I'm walking down the main street of Habarone, which is the capital of Botswana, I see a purple and white bar. It is mammoth, and it's got wildcat stuff all over it. And I say, why is there a K-State wildcat bar in the middle of mm -hmm. Habarone? They have had an exchange program with Kansas State for almost 25 years working on agricultural issues and cattle raising and animal husbandry. Today, the world's largest K-State Alumni Association is in Habarone, Botswana. And so everywhere you go, it's kind of like, they know what's going on at K-State. They don't know much about the rest of Africa, but they know, you know, it's like very disconcerting. But all the companies that are engaged in that business are beginning to flock to Botswana because that's where that expansion is going to take place. And it provides an opportunity. For a lot of American companies, we kind of miss the opportunity to be engaged in China as it was <coughs> developing. We were slow. We weren't quite sure what to do with them. They were communists. We weren't sure about this. We're now being offered when it amounts to a second chance that the next developing area is looking for attention, and frankly, they hate the Chinese. If you want to learn more about Manufacturing Day, you can go to www.mfgday.com. If you'd like to learn more about FMA, you can go to www.fmanet.org. We would also like you to go to mfgday.com and fill out a survey. Uh, let us know about your experience uh, with Manufacturing Day. If you have participated in the past, oh, we appreciate that. And if you um, are interested in partic participating in the future, uh, we're here to answer some questions. And certainly, you can find out more at uh, the website. And in wrapping this up, um, I'd like you to join me in thanking two people. Uh, FMA's president, Ed Udell, is here for opening up the FMA and inviting uh, people in for this uh, panel. And. Pat Lee is here. Pat Lee spearheaded this event. There she is. Round of applause for Pat Lee. And thank you much for attending.